We're going to be in Judges. We're going to start in chapter 1. We're just going to do kind of a generalization, a general overview tonight of the book of Judges and mainly talk about the time frame. We've, we've looked at several different situations in life, situations uh, in God's people. We've had guys like Abraham who were kind of self-contained, living a nomadic lifestyle, and God was interacting with them. Then we get to Egypt where they're in bondage, and Moses comes, and there's kind of a national identity. Moses is representing the Hebrew people, but they're not really a nation as such. They're slaves living within Egypt. We've seen them in the desert under Moses' leadership, and again, they're all one big group, and you could almost think of Moses as the king, he was the absolute leader in the desert, but they weren't really a, a people who were completely solidified yet. Uh, God was working through Moses to lead them. And for a long time after they get into the promised land, they're not really a nation. There are a lot of tribes, family groups. And the only way that I can kind of think about it in our situation would be the Old West when family groups would move and start their own uh, ranches and, and farms on the western frontier. And there might not be anybody for 20 miles. Right? There were very few large towns, few small towns and communities, but people were very spread out and they pretty much made their own decisions about how to live. Well, each tribe was given an allotment of land by God. He told them which parts of Canaan would be theirs. And then they moved into those places. And so as the fighting died down and as they started to become full-time residents of Canaan, you didn't have the nation of Israel. You had separate tribes and separate family groups that were making their own decisions about how life should be in Canaan. Now, how much interaction each group had with God is a mystery. We don't know all of the stories from all of the families. But we do know from time to time that God interacted specifically with certain groups. And so some of the judges, in fact, the earlier on in the book of Judges you are, uh, the more likely they were to be just connected to a smaller group. And the farther along you get, the more likely they are to be connected to a larger group. So like the last judge that we look at is Samuel, right? And so Samuel is a prophet basically over Israel, but he's in one place. So he only interacts with those people who are either coming to him or to whom God sends him. So don't think in terms of kingdom years, like when David is the king or Solomon is the king. These guys are really spread out and are doing the best they can in their own situations. So we'll take a little bit more of a look at that as we go by. I want us to talk first about three different generations that are kind of represented here. Uh, first, you've got Joshua's generation. Now, Joshua dies out, obviously, at the end of the book of Joshua. But his generation was the generation that had come all the way from Egypt all the way across the Red Sea, all the way through the desert years, all 40 years, and then crossed over the Jordan. So you've got Joshua and Caleb. They're the only two from that generation that went all the way from one to the other. They had seen the journey. They had seen the uh, miracles. They had been there when they heard the voice from the mountain. All of the stuff that you read about in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, those guys were present at that time for the whole deal. They're the only two that were that way that crossed over. Then there were some fighting men who were born in the desert. They grew up under Moses as the leader. They had seen a few miracles firsthand. Their, their parents were what I would call professional grade whiners. And because of that, their parents didn't get to go into the promised land. They got all the way up to the edge, sent out the spies. The spies came back and said, no, we can't take it. So their parents had all died 
in the wanderings in the desert. But this group, the younger group, uh, had grown up kind of knowing God, knowing a few of the miracles, knowing the leadership of Moses, but they probably were not at Mount Sinai. Uh, they probably were not. They didn't hear the voice. They had heard about all those things, but they're a second generation in the desert. And then the children of the invasion, as, as these soldiers, as this next generation is taking Canaan, we still have kids being born. Right? So life is going on. It seems like the whole world stands still while we take Jericho, and then we take Ai, and we move on into the cities and the hill country. But life is going on as it always did. So there are more children being born to these tribes as they're taking over the new homeland. And they're too young to remember any of the stuff that happened on the other side of the Jordan. They're the ones we keep talking about whose parents take them on the road trip and they stop and go, okay, here's where the pile of rocks is. And your grandparents were the ones that were there for that. And here's this pile of rock where we've stoned Aiken and your mom and dad were there for that one, right? But these kids, they hadn't seen any of it. They're just growing up in the promised land. And as time goes by, what happens to this youngest group in the culture is that they become assimilationists. They just kind of start melting in to the culture. They want to be part of what's going on around them. And we'll make some connections here in a little bit to our own culture and our own times. But just know that, you know, you had Joshua and Caleb who were, you know, hardened uh, had been through it all kind of guys. The next generation had been through some of it. And then you've got these babies that are growing up. They've never seen what the rest of them have seen. It's stories they hear around the dinner table. All right, so go to Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to look at some things that happen to kind of set up the problem we'll be dealing with as we go through the book of Judges. Chapter 1 verse 27 is where we're going to start. Uh, by the way, the first part of chapter 1 is pretty good news. They're wiping out people like they're supposed to. Verse 27, But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan or Tanakh or Dor or Ibleim or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nahalal, so these Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulun did subject them to forced labor. So we start seeing a pattern. Right? You remember when the Gibeonites showed up in camp while they were still at Gilgal? And they said, oh, we've come from a long way away, and look how moldy our bread is, and look how torn up our wineskins are. And so they made a treaty with them. And by making a treaty with them, they said, okay, you're going to be our servants, but they don't get rid of them. So you have a, an entire subculture of servants living among the Israelites from Gibeon. And then you see this list. Right? All of these tribes should be clearing out all of the people that have occupied the land that God gave to them, and they're not doing it. Sometimes they're just living among them, Sometimes they're forced into servitude, but either way, they're still there. Right? So if, you're, uh, if your servants have gods that they've worshipped for centuries in that place, they still have them. They still lean toward them. And as your kids grow up among the servants that you've got, they learn about all of these things. And they begin to intermarry with these people. And so you've got a person who has been dedicated to God, hopefully from birth. We don't have much record in this time frame about circumcision, whether they were still practicing circumcision, whether they were still uh, redeeming the children by making sacrifices. Uh, not exactly sure personally where the Ark of the Covenant is right now, but they are growing more and more comfortable in their surroundings and with the people that they were supposed to drive out. Right? Look over at chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. 
The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. Why was he at Gilgal? It may be that I just answered my question, although I'm not sure. Maybe the Ark of the Covenant is still at Gilgal at this point. That was, that was the first camp where they started the invasion from. Now the camp has moved on and people have moved into their inheritances. But the angel of the Lord is typically, uh, and, and even sometimes hard to tell apart from God. Remember when we were on the mountain with Moses and the bush was burning? The angel of the Lord spoke from the bush. Moses starts talking to the voice from the bush, and the next thing we know, it's God who's talking from the bush. It's hard to, to tell sometimes the difference. The angel of the Lord, the proclaimer of the Lord, the ambassador of the Lord, uh, sometimes seems to show up right before God does. But in this case, we just see the angel of the Lord. He says, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you will not make a covenant with the people of this land but you shall break down their altars, yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares for you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bochim, which means a place of whining or weeping. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. So we have an act of repentance, right? The angel comes and says, you did it wrong. Here's what's about to happen to you. And they say, we're sorry, and they make sacrifices. What do they not do? They don't get rid of anybody. They don't run anybody out of town. They just say, we're sorry, and they keep doing the same thing. Right? So uh, you've got some groups where we don't see any repentance, no apology at all. Then you've got this place where the angel of the Lord shows up and preaches some hellfire and damnation on them, and they say, well, we're sorry, and then they just keep doing what they've been doing. Look over at chapter 2, verse 10. After that whole generation, that's the generation following Joshua and Caleb, the middle generation. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them up out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. So one generation removed. You have a group who were in the desert they knew God in terms of God is the one in control. We do what God tells us. The next generation knew God is giving us the land of Canaan. right? So we'll go in and God will help us get our inheritance. The next generation said it's ours and we'll just worship how we please. Why did this young generation not know who the Lord was? Because generation number two didn't tell them. That's the reason. Now, generation number three has probably never seen a miracle. They've never been in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, probably. They've never been to a worship where sacrifices were being made uh, in the vicinity of the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. They've never had that experience. The experience they have had is Baal and Ashtoreth worship. Uh, Baal and Ashereth were the two of the predominant gods of the hill country. Now over along the coastline where the Philistines were, they worshipped Dagon. And along the, the river bottom of the Jordan, the Amalekites and Amorites and those guys, they worshipped Molech and Chemosh. All of them were extremely horrible gods. They all liked human sacrifice you know, bring your babies and sacrifice your babies and I'll make your life better, that kind of stuff. So not very long after the Israelites are given the land by God, they're worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs. The Baals and Asherahs were more fertility god and goddess. Uh, anytime you see the groves or the, uh, the orchards or the trees mentioned, that's an Asherah uh, mentioning. The idea was that if you have this 
this grove of trees. It's a sacred place, and if you have uh, if you have sex in the grove, then you're more likely to have children. Right? So Baal is uh, Baal is the god who brings the plenty, and then he Ashtoreth is his consort. So like in the spring, it would be the return of Ashtoreth to be with Baal and those kind of ancient uh, fertility rituals. They actually still exist. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody currently is worshiping Baal or some call him Baal, but uh, last time I checked, there were still cults that worship Baal and Ashtoreth. So it's, uh, it, it's the kind of God you would create for yourself if you didn't know God. You know, a God that will give me what I want, a God that will give me a bigger family and bigger crops, and, you know, it's the, the kind of thing that people look for. The Dagon was a giant fish. They lived on the coastline and subsisted by maritime stuff, fishing and boating. So the large fish is their God. So it was natural worship. They worshiped the things around them that made sense to them. And since the Israelite children didn't know any better, hadn't been taught any better, then they just bought into the culture. All right. So here's some possible connections to uh, our time frame. Uh, about, well, we'll just go back 100 years. 100 years ago in the United States, the, uh, the faith rate, I guess we'll call it, number of people who actively said we believe in God or we would call ourselves Christians, okay, broad category Christians, was in the 90s, 90%. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, we finally made it down in, to the 90% area. In the last 12 years, 2008, 2009, uh, if, if you ever get interested in this kind of thing, look up uh, the Pew... P-E-W, Pew Research Center. They do um, a lot of uh, question asking uh, surveys about church attendance. We've dropped almost 12 percentage points in the last 15 years in people that say that they believe that there is a God or that they would count themselves as being Christian. At the same time, the number of people who would answer that question as, I have no faith at all, right? It, it's a broad category. Uh, I count myself Christian, Muslim, uh, Hindu, uh, Native American religion, whatever, or nothing. The nothings have been rising steadily. Right? If you are a nothing, if you believe that there's no higher power, okay, what you're saying is, is that humans are the highest rung on the evolutionary ladder. And we decide. Right? If there is no God, then who decides what's right and what's wrong? Somebody, some human, usually the one with the biggest gun or the most money, gets to make the rules, right? Am I right? And that's where we are. Uh, we are in a place where we give more credence to the opinion of somebody who is an actor or an actress uh, a politician, no matter what their background, uh, because they have some kind of level of ascent, right? They're making more money or they're in a higher place of, of uh, noticeability. So we tend to think that they know what they're talking about. That's what happened to these people. They looked around them and they didn't find anybody that was saying, you need to, to follow Yahweh. You need to follow the God that brought us out of Egypt and across the desert and the one that gave you this land. But they had plenty of people saying, well, if you want a good crop next year or you want to have more babies, you need to worship Baal and Asherah. So it was the voices that they heard most prominently were the voices to which they were listening. It's the same argument that could be made about uh, if parents don't talk to their children about sexuality, they'll find out about it at school. Right? Who do you want telling your kid about sexuality? Somebody who's been there and understands it or somebody who hasn't and doesn't. So we, we hesitate to talk about issues that need to be addressed. But if we don't, there's a vacuum. And if there's a vacuum, then you've got this new 12% saying, 
to whom shall we listen? And evidently they're listening to people in New York and Los Angeles. All right. Uh, so the premise for the book of Judges is you have various tribes who will be faithful for a while. Then a new generation will rise up and the new generation will wander off. More likely than not, because the generation ahead of them became lax in making them toe the line when it came to Jehovah. God will send a calamity, usually in the form of a king or a nearby noble who has an army. They'll come in and squash them and make servants out of them. When they make servants out of them, then that group, and again, we're not talking about the whole nation of Israel, we're talking about a group within the nation of Israel, probably a tribe, and that tribe will say, you know, what do we need to do? And somebody will clue them in that they need to get back to worshiping Yahweh, and when they go back to worshiping Yahweh, he sends a judge. Now, the judges don't think in terms of they're sitting on the bench and with the gavel and saying, you know, let's, let's choose right from wrong. The judges, by and large, are folks who come in and lead a battle, defeat the enemy, and give freedom back to the Israelites. When the Israelites receive that freedom, then that generation will worship the Lord for a little while. Typically, we're talking about one or two generations, 40 to 80 years is about as long as any of these groups maintain this allegiance. And then again, culture seeps in and they start doing what the people around them think is the appropriate thing to do. All right, now look over at chapter 17. We'll go way over, over there. Uh, and it's not until 17 that we get this statement, but this is really a... a statement of purpose, a statement that describes the book of Judges. And I want to start reading in verse 5, 17.5. 5. Um, this man Micah had a shrine. He made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as the priest. Right? We don't know what we're supposed to be doing, so we're just doing something. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. All right. There's your phrase. It was just a bunch of loosely connected folks, each one doing what they saw to be the right thing to do. So again, he's made his own household gods. He's installed his son as the priest. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah said, where are you from? He said, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. He said, I'm looking for a place to stay. Micah said, live with me, be my father and priest, and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes, and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. Now, the questions that don't get answered in the text. The guy is a Levite, so he's from the priestly tribe. Right? So we're good with that. He's traveling to find a place where he might be of service, so we're good with that. And then the question, of whom is he the priest? This guy made his own little idols and installed his son as the priest. So now I guess we've repositioned the son somehow. We've moved him out of the job of priest. But do we still have the idols? He doesn't say he repented. He said, oh, now I know that I need to worship the Lord. He just says, now I know the Lord will be with me because I've got myself a Levite. Right? So just understand how difficult it was for this wide-ranging group of people to really know what the will of God was. Right? You and I can cast aspersions at them because it's easy for us. Right? We've got all of the rules that they didn't know printed out for us right here. Right? We know more about the law of Moses than that guy did. And some of us don't know much, but we know more than that guy did. 
we know that you don't make your own idols and put your son in as the priest. So the Levite shows up and he says, well, now I've, I've hit it big. God will be good to me because I've got a real Levite now being the priest in my household. So just, it was odd. But again, the, the statement that I, I want to leave you with, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did what they saw fit. So we're just a couple of generations removed from Egypt, right? Three generations anyway, removed from Egypt. And already they have forgotten what it's like to be under God's direct leadership. So we will take a look at some of the weird and wonderful things that happened among those judges. And I want to tell you right up front, these are not guys you want to live next door to. The judges of Israel were not folks that were polite company. They, there were some of these guys that were really out there. But they had jobs to do. They were sent by God to help his people in a particular situation. And they do exactly what God sent them to do. So Lord willing, we'll pick up with that next week. All right, see you guys later. If there's some way we can help you, by way.